and we are live. Hi. It's great. It's <laughs> great to be alive. And here you are again, one of my favorite children's authors in the whole world, past and present, Thank you. and future, <laughs> uh, Michelle Knudsen. Knudsen. Although yes. some Danish people would say Knudsen. Yes. And um, you're back on the show because you have a splendid new book called, I have the name here, The Spider Who Wanted to Be a Kitten. Yes. And we'll talk about that in a moment. You okay. are you are the superb, prize-winning, famous author <laughs> of uh, over 50 books. I can't count them. Um, of every kind and shape and form for children from board books to young adults including two of my favorite books ever, not only mine, The World's, uh, The Library Lion and Marilyn's Monster. And it's wonderful to have you back. And I'm just going to remember to say that I am Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I'm here with the wonderful Michelle Mickey Knudsen. Before <laughs> we look at your book, who should call you Michelle and who should call you Mickey? Uh I, you know, I answer to both. I mean, it's Michelle on the books, but once people get to know me, they call me Mickey. You can call me Mickey for sure. Ah, so it's like for friends call you Mickey? Yes. Ah, and people who know you professionally call you Michelle. Yes. But once they get to know me better, they usually switch over to Mickey. Except my agent. She won't. She refuses. She'll only call me Michelle. I don't know why. Okay. And I have permission <laughs> to call you both. Yes. Yes. That's rare, that's rare permission. <laughs> now let's dig into your wonderful new picture book, picture story book. Yes. So tell everybody about it. I'm just going to shut up. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, so the book is Luigi, the spider who wanted to be a kitten. And uh, it has been, it's illustrated by the wonderful Kevin Hawks, I should say, who is the illustrator also of Library Lion. And this book uh, was in the works for a while. It took a while to come together, but it's about a spider uh, who is mistaken for a kitten. And uh, and then after some initial confusion, confusion realizes he, he really likes the kitten life. And this is amazing being taken care of, getting to play. So he decides, okay, I'm going to be a kitten. And then- um, a, a Non-fly food? Yes. He experiments with- with kitten food, well, it's unclear what he's fed in the in the book. Uh, we leave it kind of open. Um, I was doing research on what spiders could actually eat. I mean, not that it's a realistic story, but anyway, um, <laughs> yes. And then, and then, of course, it's a question of how long can he keep pretending, and what will happen when inevitably um, his new friend finds out that he is actually a spider. Um, I don't want to give away the ending, but I will. I will say that I I don't really write books with sad endings, so it, it all works out. Absolutely. And uh, you also don't write uh, short books either. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. <laughs> I do not. You, you, you say it's 1,300 words, but I think it's a bit longer even. Um, but it it's gorgeous. Thank you. And uh, now is the time. We should have Kevin Hawks on the show. Yes. Ask him if he'd like to be on. I'd love to interview him. He's wonderful. Show us a few of your spreads from the book. Read a little bit. Oh, okay. Don't, don't read all of it because we'll be here forever, but read a little bit of it. We would, because it's very long. Um, okay, I'll just read the beginning. So Michelle, show it to yeah, is there. Okay. Yeah. I don't have this one memorized yet, though. Um, a big, hairy spider was looking for a home. He came upon an old house, one that was sure to have some nice, dark corners to hide in. Inside, he found an old sofa with a perfect, dark space underneath. He dressed it up, with a few quick strands of spider silk and went to sleep. I, I, I love I, I love Kevin's play with this um with this uh, framework with the little webs in the corners. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. He, he did a lot of really interesting things. I mean, there's like a lot of, you know, there's a lot of being under the sofa and like he was able to make it different and interesting. And um, and I should point out, I am terrified of spiders. And so the fact that he was able to create a spider that I um, am not, I'm, I'm very pleased with and very, <laughs> I would not be afraid of Luigi in real life. That is a masterful feat. Um, the next morning, he woke as a hand brushed against him. 
What's this? asked a voice. It feels like a kitten. I have always wanted a kitten. Gently, he was lifted out into bright, streaming sunlight. The hand and the voice belonged to a lady. She held the spider up and looked at him closely. Why, hello, she said. You are a very unusual looking kitten. I will call you Luigi. The spider was confused. He was pretty sure his name was not Luigi, and he was very sure that he was not a kitten. I'll stop that. But I do, I want to show you some of my favorite. So here's when he's he's getting his first non-spider meal. Um, and I love this one where he's playing with yarn, really getting into the kitten life. Um, and then later when he's like full on pretending, oh wait, I love this one with, he's got his little toy and she's made him a little bed. Um, and he's just lying there awake thinking about how magical it is to be a kitten. So then he starts, he starts using his legs to make himself ears and a tail, um, which is, which was all Kevin. That was all Kevin. I did so, not. Uh, you are not a person who believes in art notes. Very rarely, very rarely. Although I may have told this story before, but uh, my friend Matt Phelan, who illustrated Marilyn's Monster, I had like just a couple of art notes in there. And because we're like, usually you don't talk a lot to the illustrator during, but because we're friends, I was able to talk to him. And I was like, you know what, just just ignore that art note. Just ignore that art note. Do, you know, do what you want to do. And he's like, oh, Mickey, we always ignore the art notes. And I was like, ha, <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 so uh, run us through this. Um, it's Candlewick. Um, you have a wonderful editor there. Yes, Sarah Ketcherson is my editor there for a long time. Okay, um, maybe she wants to be on the show. I'd love to have her. She seems like a little bit of a shy person, but maybe I'm wrong. She's a lot behind the scenes, I think. Like, I don't, I don't know that she's done a lot of like. But I'll, you know, I, she can. I'm sure I'll talk to her. I'll ask her for sure. It it so run us through this. So you, you have this amazing agent, Jody Reimer, and um, how did this book play out? Um, well, actually, for this one, uh, I sent it to Sarah directly because we have this we have this wonderful relationship since I've been working with her for so long. Where I could be like, you know, I'm working on this story. I don't know if yeah. it's working. Hey, I mean, I talked hey, to Jody hey. first. Yeah, a yeah. Mickey walked into the candlewick. <laughs> um to, to paraphrase your library lion yes i yeah i got the reference i know yeah but not everybody else did. Or maybe they did maybe they did. <laughs> um so like i you know i usually i tell jody if i have something that i feel like ah you know it's not ready but maybe i could show it to sarah and she's like go ahead so um i showed it to sarah and it wasn't it was not working um i mean the origin story for this is that i was i was between apartments in new york city and I have a very lovely friend who had a house upstate. He's like, you can crash at my house until you find an apartment. And he got me set up and then he went back to the city and I'm alone at this house in the country. And they have very big spiders in the country. And of course, as soon as he left, this enormous spider appeared um, and was just there like in the house with me. Um, and I talked to him because I'm, you know, I'm terrified, but I'm not, I don't kill them. You know, they're very good creatures I'm not going to do that but he was also way too big for me to like try to catch him in something and put him outside so I named him Luigi uh and I would talk to him about hold on hold on a second Mickey Michelle um I, I believe that there's importance in names mm -hmm. like you didn't uh, um just name him Luigi or did you I, well, I did, but I'm sure it came from somewhere, you know, like I wanted a name that sounded friendly and, um, you know, like, like, I feel like a, like a, like someone named Luigi is not going to hurt me. You know, he sounds like a, like a friendly guy. It's an Italian name. And like, I, I love Italy. It's my favorite country to visit. And yeah, uh, you see, you see, <laughs> it just felt, but, but, right. but it, it, Luigi is an Italian. Where is he from? What does he do for a living? The spider? No, the Luigi. <laughs> well, there's no real Luigi. It's just. Uh, oh, okay. It's just. I mean, there are, I guess, lots of real Luigis. But he wasn't based on anyone. It was just. It just he, felt he, right. He was. He was an ephemeral Luigi. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah. So that's uh, that's where the name came from. And so I, when I finally, nothing bad ever happened. He stayed away from me. I would see him crawling around and 
you know, keep my distance. And then when I got home, I just sort of couldn't stop thinking about it. And so I wrote the story. Initially, there's a lady who loses her glasses and then thinks that she's found this kitten. And all the neighborhood children are like, it's not a kitten. She's like, what are you talking about? And it's like spinning webs on the porch and catching like the neighbor pets and stuff. And and it was funny and I liked it, but it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't have any heart really. It was just kind of a silly story. Um, so I kept working on it, kept working on it. And it was Sarah's idea to try writing it from the spider's point of view. And that changed everything because then, then you're feeling what he's feeling and you, you, you're kind of on this journey with him and it, it made it, that was what made it start to work. There's nothing like editors, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Like it's, they, 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 I don't think it's their job necessarily to tell us um, what to do or how to write, but to, to, to pinpoint these things, you know, what would happen if you change the POV? Yeah, like they ask those perfect questions and then you're like, oh, yes, and then you go and you work. And, yeah. So um, you, we, in our previous conversation, you told me something that I found amazing, and I'm wondering whether we should discuss this for a moment. Okay. Uh, you, you told me that you wrote Library Lion on a purple envelope at 2.30 <laughs> in the morning. Yep. And and you, you didn't stop until it was done. And then more or less it was done. Almost. I mean, I wrote, it, it, I had a first draft that, that first night slash morning. Um, it didn't all fit on the envelope. It was an envelope and like whatever paper was handy. Um, and then there was like, sorry, I was, a, I was at my, I was at my dining room table and uh, this is what in I Ithaca, lived Ithaca, in Ithaca. Yeah, where, yeah, in New York City, I don't. There's no dining, you know. There's no dining room tables, but you know, I had a house when I was up there, so there was more room. And I was sitting there, and uh, it was just whatever I could reach that was on the table, like scraps of paper, or whatever that was nearby. Um, so I wrote out the whole first thing, but it was there was like a section missing. And in the morning, when I woke up and read it, I was like, "There's something missing," and I worked on it a little more. But it was still pretty much 24 hours, that first draft, just like, okay, I don't know where. Just so so here's the, and, and what about, and what about the spider? And the spider is the opposite. Like it just took, I mean, I wrote that first draft in 2017. So I've been working on this story for a very long time. So, so you see that there's no, I was just going to say here, this is the way to succeed is to write your first draft. And you see, nothing really, there's no real rules, are there? No. There's the, the rule of less than 500 words, which you keep breaking. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and last time you told me that you, that, that, that library line kind of wrote itself in the middle of the night, and I'm saying, oh, Spider Luigi, and then you tell me, no, 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 it went through many, uh, many revisions. So yeah. there's no, there's no fast and steady rules, are there? No. I mean... Although you still have to write the first draft. Nothing ever happens until you write the first draft, no matter how long it takes you. That's does, still does, it ever, does it ever happen to you that you say, oh, this is a great idea. This is a great idea. Oh, I can't wait till I'm home and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write it on a paper, on whatever, on the wall. And you write <laughs> the first draft and you look at it and you say, oy vey. Yeah, all the time. All the time. I have lots and lots of started stories that like I was all excited about and then I'm like, oh no, that doesn't work at all. But I save them because sometimes I come back to them and I and and later some I'll I'll find the thing, you know, I'll find a way to like make it work or I'll take something from it and use it for a different story. I save everything. Yeah. What I call thinking between the boxes. Yeah. It's it, it's it's all about taking things that shouldn't be connected like a furry, loving uh, spider that um, becomes, tries to become a cat. So, so Michelle, you know, the, the, um, the lady in the story, I mean, she has white hair, but she's a little bit like you. And, and um, Luigi is a little bit like you. Um, who's more like, who, who do you, who do you, um, uh, identify with more in the story oh that's no one's asked me that yet that's a good question um I mean I think there is a little there has to be a little bit of me in all my characters right to be able to yeah for sure that that wasn't the question I know there's a cat, every library line you're everybody I know that <laughs> who are you the who are you the most um uh probably probably Luigi because Betty is very sure of herself 
and uh, she's got everything figured out and I'm definitely not there. Um, like she's so calm and loving. And I think I aspire to be like Betty, like the fact that she yeah. just takes everything and, she, you okay. know, she's very calm. She's very accepting. And I mean, I try to be all those things, but uh, I just, I feel like she's got a lot more life experience. She's been around the block. Um, and Luigi is much more, you know, I worry like Luigi, I worry if people like me, I worry like what they think of me and how I'm coming across and well, isn't this, isn't this imposter syndrome? Yeah. I mean, I you know, w w when he starts to think that, think that he's being accepted as a cat or a kitten, then he has all this angst that writers have. Do you yes. have this angst, Michelle? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm worried that everything is I'm doing is actually terrible. And I mean, you now know, that you're, you're world famous and <laughs> you hope that like when you write a book and they, and somebody decides to publish it, you hope that like, okay, it must be at least a little good or, or they wouldn't publish it. But you know, books come out that nobody reads books come out that like, don't, uh, don't have a long life. Like you never know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, so every book you're, you're, terrified i think when it when it actually comes out and, you know so i i sense this angst in luigi mm -hmm. you know like um who am i well because he thinks he knows right in the beginning he thinks he knows and then he's sort of given this this opportunity to see a different kind of life and it shakes everything up um and then he thinks in order to have that life he's got to be a certain way you know um as a, as opposed to the library line who just walks into the library yes. um which is a, a different kind of book and um this book has been translated into umpteen languages more than 20 i i'm uh, yeah i have to count it, 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 in, including a language that doesn't exist no i'm joking um, <laughs> and i'm segueing now because um it's actually been turned into a musical here in yes. israel Yes. Well, it's been running in Israel now for about 10 years, which is just blows my mind. Um, and they are working on a version in English in the U.S., uh, which I'm so with the same. It's based on um, the same playwrights. I'm going to butcher his last name. It's Ellie. I can't I don't know how to. I. This is terrible. Oh, this is terrible. I don't even want to try to say it. <laughs> And if he's listening, he's going to be very mad at me. But uh, he's brilliant. And he wrote the uh, Israeli version. And so we're working uh, with Adam Theater in Boston. Um, and they're creating a uh, an English version based on that play. And they're going to start it um, in the initial performances are going to be in the Boston Public Library. Um, and they're going to have like children, school children come in and um, be in in the library experiencing this amazing thing and then it's going to move on to theaters and i'm very excited and where and when is it supposed to debut uh september i'm not sure of the exact start dates yet but september is when it's scheduled to start so it's all happening very fast and it should start in uh, ithaca it would be amazing if we could do it in ithaca oh my goodness uh because since that's where i was when it all started the ithaca i mean the cornell library system is just amazing and beautiful and uh i should i should see if i could make that happen that would be amazing okay amazing. well wonderful and 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 this is also an opportunity to talk about you as a, as a show person i didn't yeah. know this about you that you sing and, and act well it's been i mean it's probably been about a decade since i was last in a in a musical um but what, yeah what musicals I, have you been in a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan, to the dismay of all my friends who <laughs> would come and see me who were not Gilbert and, Gil, Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Pirates of Penzance is my favorite. I've been in that one three or four times. HMS Pinafore. Yes. I think that was the last one I was in was Pinafore um, with the Village Light Opera Group in uh, New York City. And, Amazing. Uh, so fun. I love it. Now I do karaoke. That's the only, every year on my birthday, my friends know that's what we're doing because it's my only outlet. Almost you, my you only you just had a birthday. I did. I know that you had a birthday, not only because of Facebook, because your husband <laughs> bought you an incredible uh, birthday gift. Yes. Um, he knew that I have long, have long wanted. Well, I mean, I never actually really even dreamed that I would, 
so I love snakes. I just love snakes. And when we, we go hiking and stuff, and like, if someone sees a snake, like the, my stepdaughter's like, oh, Mickey, come here, you know, and everybody freezes and I run over and I see them and they're so, I think they're just amazing. And, uh, so for my birthday, I was, I was, he enabled me to get a snake. Um, and they're much more. No, I, I, I'm trying to think if I bought my wife a snake for her birthday. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you, can't, you have to know they want it. You can't just it, surprise somebody. With this that. is not a general idea to all the people who are watching and listening. This is not Mickey Knudsen's best advice. No, do not give your spouse a snake without warning. Um, but no, he's teeny tiny. He's adorable. He's an albino corn snake, and uh, he doesn't have a name yet. I'm still. Try. They live a long time, so like they can live twenty to thirty years. So I have to think of a really yeah. good and, and and they eat spiders. Uh, well, I guess they could eat spiders. I mean, this one eats frozen little baby mice. Um, I know it's it's hard, but you know it's that's the it's the circle of life. I don't know <laughs> your face. <laughs> Where do you buy frozen little mice? They sell them at like um, pet supply stores and stuff. You're giving me like a million ideas for a story here. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's actually, it's, I've, I've been told that it's not, it's not really safe to give them live mice because it's, I mean, first of all, it's, it's very traumatic for the mouse. Right. And also it's could be dangerous for the snake. So. Um, yeah. Better but, to freeze the mice first. That's not traumatic. Well, it, I, I don't want to, this is not a road I want to go down. I feel very conflicted, <laughs> it, but I, you know. Okay. I'm not a vegetarian. I can't, I, you know. It's okay. I mean, it, 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 it's important, I think, for people to know uh, both sides of Michelle and Mickey <laughs> Knudsen Knudsen. Yes. The many, so, many. No, and, and it, it, it's okay because this is what we're made of as authors. Um, so let's go back to the uh, to the show and, um, and what, if you could appear in a show, what would it be? Oh, like if I could, if I could be on one now. Well, you could pick any show. Would it be Gilbert and Sullivan? I'm, you're you're opening on Broadway and whatever you want. I mean, what what, what would you like? What to one of the reasons I love Gilbert and Sullivan is because they're really fun. So I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a leading lady. Like I don't, I'm in the chorus. Like that's my level of of singing ability. You know, like I can do okay in the chorus. I mean, I always aspired to maybe one day have a small part in Pirates, but um. But not, I don't, I mean, well, it doesn't matter. But uh, so I love the Gilbert and Sullivan shows because they're, they're amazing. Like the harmony is beautiful. There's so much to do. Like you get, you have a character to play in the course and it's very, very fun. Um, but I mean, it, like, let's imagine that I took lots of lessons and became very, very talented and could have any role. Yeah. We're talking, we're talking fiction here. Oh, that's hard. You know, I kind I, I focused on a lot of my favorite in my in my young adult series, Evil Librarian. There's a musical theater uh, plot in each one, and I I've, I've never seen it performed, but the Scarlet Pimpernel has a lot of beautiful music in it, and I would I feel like I would love to be in that. Um, oh, and also chess. Chess is beautiful. Uh, I've also never seen it performed, but I but I someday. So someday. so um, so let's say that you're auditioning now. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to sing just a few bars from no. one of your favorite tunes. Oh, oh no. <laughs> no, no. No, no. Okay. So, <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I tried. I tried. Um, once upon a time, I was able to coerce my uh, interviewees into um, into singing, but uh, I've given that up for Lent. Um, <laughs> and I've given Lent up for Lent because I'm Jewish. Um, so, <laughs> so, 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 Mickey, let's talk about something you said a few years ago. Um, okay. in another interview about the importance of visualizing the page turns and the layout of your story. I think this is really important. Can you elaborate a bit? Um, well, it's something special about picture books that if you're, if you write in different formats, it's not something that you might think about, but you know, as we were looking at the book before, right, it's not, you're not reading prose just down a page. There's pauses where the pages are being turned and where the illustrations are changing. And so I, I always start, I always start without thinking about any of that. Um, but at some point you have to think about your story and sort of the flow of events and the flow of the text and think about where you could logically break it up uh, in ways that are going to work in the picture book format. Um, they also have to be printed in signatures of eight pages. So you you have like either 32 pages or 40 
pages if you're me or 48 pages <laughs> if you're library lion um but but you also don't have all of those pages right because um some of them might be end papers some of them might be the title page uh some of them might be the copyright page so i guess this is the title page that well, was when, when you submit the manuscript yes uh, you have the page breaks in mind yes but i don't I've usually paged it out to make sure it works, but then I put it back together and I take the pages out okay, because so, the editor might so, have different ideas. Exactly. So, so you've created a page, a, a dummy book um, at some level. So you have an idea where the pages turn, even though that, not, that might not be where the pages turn. It's not our job to right. decide where the pages turn, but it is our job to envision what the book might look like. Right. Like you want to make sure it, it can it at least can work in the picture book format, even if the final version is going to be a little different. And some some authors will do um, I mean, obviously, illustrators do a lot more of this, but authors will do little thumbnails to be like, OK, what can the illustrate? Because you want to make sure you have different illustrations on every page. Um, and that can well, actually I, I, I teach making dummy books in minutes, so I will teach you sometime. Oh, OK. Uh, um, but uh it's enough if you have as much experience as you do to envision how the story is laying out on the pages as you write it or how it might work. Right. Um, and um, so this uh, brings me uh, towards the end of our conversation. Right. What are you doing now? Oh, well, right now, uh, I should be working on it as we speak. I am working on it. If my editor's listening, I'm just obviously not while we're talking working on it. Uh, I have a new middle grade fantasy novel that I'm very excited about that is scheduled to come out next year. And it doesn't have a title yet because I title, I am terrible at titles. I either have the title from the- Has it, has, has it been announced? Something, something, something? Um, I feel like it's been announced as untitled middle grade novel. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so I, yeah, part of my job during this last revision is to come up with what to call it. Um, but it's a it's about two um two young girls and one of them is able to open portals to another world and they get kind of caught up in this whole this whole situation between two worlds and there's magic and dragons and all my favorite things. See, okay, so th this this opens up a whole Pandora's <laughs> book book. Um, you write for all age groups. I'm going to um, wonder whether your soft spot. We talked about this last time, but I'm, I'm I have to reconsider now. Because I think that you are best known for your picture books. Am I right or wrong? Yes, I think that is true. Okay. But you love writing uh, for other ages. You love middle grade, young adult. And you told me that you started writing short stories for adults. Mm -hmm. So with the real Michelle Knudsen, stand up. <laughs> where, where, is your, where is your heart? I don't know. That's a good question. Um... I mean, I've I've always been sort of like a like a combination plate kind of person, you know. Like I like a little of this, a little of that. Um, my friends, uh, I've my two best friends. We we meet up for dinner and go to shows a lot, and they're always concerned when there's a big menu because they're like, oh, it's gonna take it forever to decide. Because I I I don't know. I like to be all over the place. So, I mean, I feel like the age I was when I started to really love books, like in the and realize that like oh an author is a thing you can be and like this is what I want to do was around I want to say age 12 maybe like middle school age um and so I think middle grade is always going to be a special place was this it was this a time of some turmoil for you when you were 12 you know that age is hard for a lot of people but uh yeah there were some bad summer camp experiences and like you feel very uncertain but there was a lot of like doubt about whether people liked me and like some friendship struggles and you know if I could escape into these books and the books I loved most were it's always about I mean it's about the worlds and everything but it's always about the characters at the heart and like you know characters who are good friends and love each other and like I feel like I learned how to be a good we were talking about being a good person before we started like uh I feel like I learned that from the books I was reading. Like, these are people who like look with their, and it's adventure stories, right? So they're like going into danger for each other and rescuing each other. And like, they really love each other and care about each other. And like that, all my books have something like that in them, I think, because that's the, 
the heart of it for me. Yeah, but on the on the other hand, your, your ability, your imagination with the uh, young children is is phenomenal. What? Like that, pe people are going to look at this, and and I mean, like I got to know you a tiny bit, so I say, okay, this is really typical, Michelle, <laughs> right? Uh, writing about a spider who who entertains the possibility of becoming a a kitten. Yes. This is so so like you. <laughs> um I guess I mean I guess the I guess the things I write about translate well to different ages because that's that's always a thing. I mean even from a young age I think you you're worried about um the kinds of worries that young children have. I don't know. I mean you're not thinking so much about okay. I hope about whether people like you when you're when you're five, but you know, about your interaction with the world and friendship and like how to sort of navigate new situations, you know? I'm going to throw out a new theory here. Okay. It's not a new theory. That because you like to write across the genres, your picture books are even more appealing because that makes them universal. Oh, that's a nice theory. I like that so theory. So anybody can read Library Line and have a reader response. The other thing that I've learned over the years is, you know, when you start say, oh, you know, a library walked in, a library a library walked into a lion. That's a good one. A mm -hmm. lion walked into a library and you say, but what was the lion doing, <laughs> you know, in, in Ithaca? And uh, why did he walk into and and, and 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 it's all ridiculous and um, and and this and the spider. But kids, they eat ridiculous for breakfast. Yes. Well, that's why I, I probably told you last time, but like I fell into picture books and children's books completely by accident. And my first love was fantasy and science fiction. Still, I mean, you know, that's still my favorite thing, but it's because children's books can be about anything because kids will, they're open to whatever story you want to tell them, whatever amazing things happen. Like they just take that in and go with yeah. it. But, but, but picture books are also to adults. They're yes. to the librarians and to the parents reading it and to the teachers and the editors and the agents and... You know, they're, they're, if you don't pass the adult, a, right. you're not going to have a picture book. Yeah, that's a, it's a very tough thing about so, writing. So, 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 now I, so now I figured you out, you see, because your ability <laughs> to write to every age is what is needed. And then the other thing that you have is the theatricality. Hmm. It, it, it's, not, um, it's not a matter of coincidence that Library Lion has become a, uh, a play. Your writing is theatrical. I can I can see Luigi becoming a play for children. Oh, that would be amazing. And 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 a lot of the people I interview love theater, have been involved with theater, and this nails what I've learned over the past interviewing almost two hundred authors is that children's books have to be theatrical. Yes, I think that's true. Um, and I mean they're. Picture books are so visual, it sort of lends itself to that, right? You know, there's that, you are sort of watching it unfold along with the narration. So that tends to Absol work. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the last thing I wanted to ask you today, okay. uh, because I want to have you back in a year or so, um, is the process by which this particular book, Luigi, the spider who wanted to be a kitten, how did it work out? Because Kevin Hawk, you, you know, and you work together on Library Lion, and um, you're not supposed to see the artwork, and you're not supposed <laughs> to bother the illustrator very much. Right. How did how did this play out? Um, well, we we were doing an a oh, gosh, I can't remember which one it was. But we were doing a podcast interview for Library Lion, and they asked us at the end, you know, what are you working on next? And so I mentioned, oh, I'm working on this picture book about spider. I was mistaken for a kitten and Kevin was like oh do you have an illustrator for that yet and I was like why no and I but he didn't <laughs> I didn't know if he was kidding you know like I didn't know if he was just being funny and I don't know him well enough um that I could have been like I don't know I was afraid to ask him directly so I told my editor I was like I don't know if he was serious but he might want to do it and she was like oh my god that would be amazing so uh, you know and then but things happened behind the scenes at the publisher so I guess the art director talked to him um and we were so happy that he agreed to do it and so excited. Everybody was so excited. But then, yeah, the I don't. illustrations are amazing. Yeah. And I see I see sketches at various points, um, but I still, I don't talk to Kevin about them. 
like like my editor will show me like initial character sketches maybe and they're probably not even initial character sketches they like they've been working or whatever no but you must have worried about the spider I mean I was I was I was glad that I didn't have to be the one to try to come up with a way to draw him in a way that would make him appealing and because I really do I have a, a phobia like I did exposure therapy to try to like deal with my spider phobia at one point um I find them most of them in real life just upsetting to look at you know and I'm like how's he gonna do this good luck man I, I'm glad it's not me and he he can't like it's just he's so soft and furry and like um you do kind of want to hug him and snuggle up with him which is amazing how did he make a spider so cuddly I don't know it's, it's a amazing. wonderful cuddly spider hey, your, your your book the, the text is 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 gorgeous um you. you don't feel like the 1300 words are there you just <laughs> Boom, until you finish the story. It's it's so it's so wonderful. Um, and the last thing is I've been asking you the last thing now for 15 minutes. I don't know why you <laughs> That's okay. I don't, I'm good. <laughs> I don't I don't want to let you go. Um, so is of the 50 plus books that you've written, uh, many of which are illustrated, is there one book where you didn't like the illustrations? Is there such a thing? No. Sometimes they're not what I imagine, especially early on, because at, at this point I get a vote, you know, I get to be part of the conversation. Um, but early on, it was more like, here's your illustrator, you know, like doesn't matter what you think. Um, so there would be times would be like, oh, that's not what I pictured at all, but it's still great. It's just different. Um, and the, I mean, that's been part of my, now I love that. Now I love the idea that like, I'm going to be surprised by what the illustrator comes up with. But it's in the beginning, it's hard because you're like, no, it's my story. And this is what I was picturing for this scene. And like, why aren't they drawing what I want? Um, and so, you know, I had to sort of learn to let go of that. But it's, I mean, now I'm just amazed by what the illustrators can do. And like, they're, I, they come up with like Kevin did with the spider legs and the ears. Like I would never have imagined that. So I'm happy to let them kind of work their magic and not get in the way. Absolutely. So um, you need to let go. That's one of the wonderful things about picture books is that in order to have the book, you have to lose the book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a hard thing to learn too, especially when you're, when you're starting out and like you have this, you know, you've, you've pictured it all in your head, you know what it's supposed to look like and how do you, how do you release that? But you have to, you have to do that with every book, right? You have to send it out into the world eventually and people read it and you're not there to be like, Oh no, no this is what I meant. Like, this is what this is about. You know, they, have their own interpretations. The, the death of the author. Yeah. This is, the book goes out and it's it's really not yours anymore. Yeah. But that's a it's wonderful a, thing too, right? Like it becomes different things to different people and. That, that's, that's the magic. Yeah. That's the magic. Yeah. The, the, the picture, a, own... picture, a picture book starts out as your story. And then it becomes the editor's story. And then it becomes the uh, illustrator's story. And then it becomes the reader's story. Yeah. It's gorgeous. I, I can't think of anything that is more challenging, exciting to do. And um, I'm really, I'm, I must say this. Uh, I'm going to call you Mickey now because I'm really honored to have this opportunity to talk to you. You are a, a star and a guiding light in this uh, in this field, in this industry. And um, I really love your new book. I hope it goes on to become another musical. Um, <laughs> and I will come to Broadway to see it. And um, lots of good luck. And uh, congratulations on your new book. So we have been talking with Michelle Mickey Knudsen, Knudsen if you're Danish, and talking about her new wonderful book, The Spider Who Wanted to Be a Kitten of All Things, which is illustrated by the wonderful Kevin Hawks and is published by Candlewick just out this month. And uh, it's wonderful. And thanks so much. I had so much fun. I was looking forward to it. And hey, um, thanks for having me back on. Yeah, it, well, you know, I, I, I usually don't have authors um, back on it three times. But if you go on writing right, these kinds of stories, <laughs> I'll have you on till uh, infinite. So, uh, Michelle Mickey Knudsen, thank you so much. And uh, to all of our readers, uh, listeners, and watchers, um, I am Mel Rosenberg for the 
Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I've been here with the wonderful Michelle Knudsen celebrating her new spider book. Thank you so much. Take, take care, dear. <laughs>